Yes, thanks everyone. I'm really excited to be talking about coffee today. It's one of my great passions. Um, and hopefully I can share with you a little bit about what I've learnt uh, about what makes a great espresso and what makes a, a bad espresso and how you can uh, make more great ones. Um, so we're going to start at the real basics and then work our way up to something more and more advanced as we go. So first, just what is espresso? Then we're going to go into um, the real beginner's level. How do you kind of dial in the right espresso uh, with the equipment that you've got? Um, and then we're going to crack out the big guns, the, uh, the ISO standard for, for espresso and number by number what that means. And I've got some, some graphs and charts to show you exactly what's happening. We're going to delve into the numbers and see um, how that works actually with pulling an espresso. Uh, and then uh, thinking about more modern, uh, more modern espresso, um, lighter roast and things like that, how things change there. Um, and then we're going to talk about how you break the rules, so where the ISO standard for espresso breaks down um, and finish up with my cheat sheet because I think the standard's wrong, uh, but we'll get to that and, and what the standard should be. So the real ultra super basics of how you make coffee, pretty much every coffee recipe in the world is this. Um, you get coffee beans that are roast, you add water, um, sometimes you add heat, usually. Um, usually you filter out the beans and you end up with coffee. But there's a myriad different things you can do within that to make good or, or bad coffee along the way. Uh, and one way of thinking about it is in terms of the strength of coffee that you get. So um, with sort of a pour over or a drip style coffee, you're about one and a half percent total dissolved solids. So that's um, how much of the liquid that's in there is actually, uh, is actually dissolved coffee. Uh, for something like a mocha pot or like a Turkish coffee, you're, you're almost double that. Uh, but espresso is way stronger. So um, between 7.5% and 9.5% of total dissolved solids is what's in an espresso. And I think, to me, that's one of the reasons that espresso is such a popular um, drink. Because, because it's so strong, uh, people often like to drink it much weaker than that. So you can dilute down espresso with different amounts of water and cream and milk and, and foam and, and chocolate and things like that to produce this whole family of different drinks. And if you have a look at the, the menu at Starbucks, virtually every single one of those drinks is somehow a dilution of, of what's, uh, what's an espresso. Uh, so it's a really versatile drink, but even if you don't like this real strong espresso, I'm sure there's, there's alternatives that you can use from there. Uh, but it's actually really hard to make. Um, and we're going to be addressing these two things that make it really hard today, and hopefully I can demystify both of these things for you. Uh, so one of them is it happens inside this chamber that you can't see. It's, it's fully, it's enclosed, it's, um, it's opaque, you can't see what's going on inside there, and you can't change it. You can't get in there and stir it up, you can't, uh, you can't make changes as it goes, and, and that makes it really difficult to know whether it went well or not. The second thing that makes espresso really hard is the coffee bed itself is the filter. So the coffee bed itself is what's giving the pressure back. And so you need to prepare that bed of coffee really, really well because ultimately uh, that's what dictates the pressure and flow rate and that dictates uh, whether you're going to have a good espresso or not at the end of it. So that's what, that's what espresso is. Um, the first thing um, that I learned, the first thing that I sort of started getting wrong about espresso was about grind and extraction. So we're going to start talking about that. So what you want is this kind of perfectly balanced, perfectly balanced cup where everything tastes nice and sweet and complex and aromatic. Um, I'm sure if you've, you've drunk coffee before, sometimes you'll just have one of those and you'll go, that's, the, that's exactly the, the way that I like my coffee. And what we do is we measure extraction yield. So that's by weight, the percentage of what coffee was, was actually in that puck, how much of it ends up in the cup. And so somewhere between 19 and 23% seems to be about the right figure that, that the human taste buds really, really like. You extract all of the goodness and yumminess out of, out of that coffee, uh, but none of, none of the bitter things. Uh, what I started doing when I first started making espresso was I was getting these really sour, watery uh, type, type cups of coffee. And um, those types of flavors, that vegetal flavor or the salty or thin, uh, particularly sour though, uh, often that means that you're extracting too little. So the, what's in the cup, you haven't extracted enough yet, um, and that extraction yields under 19%. If you go too far the other way, you end up with over-extracted coffee. 
And so what that tastes like is really astringent and harsh. Um, I taste the, something kind of chalky. And pretty much the maximum possible that you're able to get out, um, able to dissolve into the cup is about 30%. Uh, but usually you'll be, if you're over 23%, you'll taste it, that there's, there's this kind of bitterness to it. So the first way you can tell where you are on that spectrum is by tasting it. Does it taste like those things in the middle? Or does it taste sour and um, uh, thin, like on the left? Or does it taste bitter and harsh, like on the right? Um, and you can sort of move, move your extraction left to right, and I'll tell you how in a minute. The other way you can tell, if you're not quite sure from tasting it, is by watching it come out. Uh, so I, I pulled three shots earlier just to, um, to demonstrate. So a well-extracted espresso looks like this. It sort of pulls together like honey. It's really thick and rich as it, as it dri um, dribbles into the cup. Um, but an under-extracted coffee looks like this. It splashes everywhere, it gushes out. You can see it's splashed um, mess all over the back of my machine. It's a much paler color. And when you taste that coffee, it t you, you, before you even taste it, you know that it's going to be under-extracted. Over-extracted coffee looks like this. It's almost black, it's very, very dark, and it sort of drips rather than pulling together in a, um, in a nice channel. So the, the first thing you need to know um, about, uh, about how, to, how to change your extraction level is grinding. So if it's looking too, too under-extracted or if it's tasting sour, you need to grind finer. Um, if, at the other hand, it's something that is tasting over-extracted and, and dripping away, you need to grind coarser. This was the first, the first lesson I learned. And most people, and certainly me, um, started off on the left-hand side with these sour coffees. And so the kind of the default beginner's advice is, well, maybe you should, you should grind finer. Um, I found with my first grinder, even when I said it on the minimum possible grind, it wasn't fine enough. Um, so there's a hack that you can do, which is that you're able to um, shim your grinder to, to grind finer. So here's how you do it. Um, you pull out, pull out from the grinder um, the burrs, which look like a little bit of a cone there. Um, and then you place a thin shim. So it could be uh, a circle of aluminium, or it could be some card or, or paper. Put it back together, and it will push those burrs slightly closer together. And what you want is to be able to turn it finer and finer until it just chirps. It just makes a little bit of a noise, and that means it's that the minimum possible. As soon as you hear that noise, back off, because it's not good for the burrs. But um, that's how you know you're at the minimum possible. So that's, that's step one. But we're, uh, we're just getting started. So let's now talk about the ISO standard for espresso. And it gets really complicated. I'm not going to go through all of these numbers. But on the left, what we have is the ISO 45011, the certified Italian espresso. In the middle, we have a different standard, which is if you're competing in the World Barista Championships. And on the right is how modern uh, espresso is made at, at coffee shops. So a couple of things to note. Uh, espresso is getting bigger. Traditionally, people would do 7 gram shots. Now, people are grinding between 18 and 22 grams into the basket, and so sort of doing 9 to 11 gram shots. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, temperature standards are terrible. Um, traditionally, espresso machines, you set the, the temperature of the boiler itself, and then that water works its way through the machine, and where it, when it comes out of the shower head, it's, it's between four and six degrees colder. So people set their espresso machines five, four, four to six degrees hotter than they actually want it to brew. And so some standards talk about boiler temperature, and some talk about brew temperature, uh, and that's all over the place. We'll get into that in a minute. Um, the third thing is that uh, particularly modern um, sort of third wave coffee shops are starting to brew at lower, lower pressures. Traditionally, everyone just brewed at nine bars, and as we'll see later, that's, that's not always good. The last thing, if you happen to be competing in the World Barista Championships, you have to serve your coffee in a 60 to 90 mil vessel with a spoon, a napkin, and unflavored water. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. So, to, what we're going to do now is we're going to brew a coffee exactly to ISO standards, and we're going to, to use this machine here. Um, the reason we're using this machine, this is a decent Espresso DE1, is it enables you to fully program the pressure, temperature, uh, flow rates, and all of that. Now, so this is a schematic of what's happening inside that machine. We're not going to go through all of this, but we're just going to go through uh, the two main water parts. So this one here, we've got a pump that extracts the cold water, heats it up, and then forces it through uh, the coffee puck. We have a second pump that has cold water without heating it up and mixes them together. And so by adjusting those two pumps, 
instantaneously we can change the total flow rates, pressure rate, or by changing the mix we can instantaneously change the, um, the temperature. Ooh. And we've got, uh, we've got five different sensors that I'll be showing you on the graphs that are about to come. Uh, the first on the far left is a flow rate of how much water is getting pumped into the top of the puck. Um, on the far right is a flow rate of how much water is coming into the cup, because they don't always match up. We have a temperature sensor of, of what temperature water is, and a temperature sensor of what the brew temperature is, and then we've got a pressure sensor, so you can see exactly how much pressure is building up uh, inside the puck there. So pulling in the exact standard for, for an ISO espresso, ISO standard, here's what happened. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig into this in a minute, but the very first thing that is obvious to me is the standard pretends that everything's going to be a straight line, that you just have an exact pressure, that you have an exact time, and it's all, it's all done, but that's actually not the case. The, the thing changes throughout the brew. So this green line is pressure, uh, the blue line is how much is flowing into the top, and brown is how much is flowing into the bottom. And so we start off at a really low pressure. The machine just can't build up the pressure. What's happening is this, the puck is acting like a sponge. All of that hot water is just soaking straight in. Then the, the puck starts to expand and the pressure starts to build up. Still, all of that water that's flowing in is pouring in really fast, but it's just filling up the space inside the puck. Then the first drips come into the cup, and then finally we're actually pulling the shot. Um, so water is flowing into the, the top of the puck at the same rate as it's flowing into the cup. And then once we've hit our, hit our um, espresso point, um, there's a, a solenoid inside the machine, and all of that extra pressure, pressure flows out the back and into the waste. So, pull that, pull that cup, how did it taste? It tasted 80% of the way there. It was something that most people would be happy with uh, getting in a, in a, in a um, cafe, but it wasn't, it wasn't perfect. Uh, so if we think about those, those flavors of was it under-extracted or over-extracted or just in the middle, well actually, it was all three. Um, mostly, that was exp extracted to the numbers and it was mostly extracted well, but I also got some of those sour and thin and salty flavors and also could taste some of the, the harsh flavors. So what's going on there? It's both under-extracted and over-extracted. I couldn't grind finer or coarser because it would, it would knock it out. So we'll come to that in just a second. Um, but my, my advice at this point is, if you want to hit the, the standard numbers, and it, it is really useful to do, weigh how much you put into the cup, I'm uh, sorry, into the, the beans that you grind, weigh how much uh, goes into the cup and get that ratio right. What I didn't show you was the, the temperature graphs. And you can see here, that top red line is the, the temperature of the water going in. Um, and the bottom orange line is the temperature that the brew happened, and that brew never got up to temperature. Uh, and the reason for that uh, was I, I didn't actually uh, finish preheating. This wasn't on purpose, this was just I realized afterwards. Uh, didn't finish preheating. So um, I have noticed it makes it actually a really big difference if everything's nice and hot beforehand, if your machine's well preheated, if all of the things that are going to have coffee in them are, are all as hot as possible. It, help, it um, starts off the brew at, at a higher temperature and starts extracting really well. So now we're going to start talking about why we were getting under-extracted and over-extracted flavors at the same time. And we're going to start by talking about the different types of beans and the diff different roast levels. So it is a spectrum. You can, you can roast it at any level. But um, broadly, we think about three types three types of roast levels. So there's the traditional espresso, which is that sort of dark, dark roast. There's a medium roast, which is more sort of slightly fruity and, and caramelly. And then there's the lighter roast, which has got sort of um, fruit and berry type flavors and floral flavors. And if you, if you go to a, um, a roaster and you pick up a bag of coffee and you're not sure whether it's a light roast or a dark roast, you can look at the beans or you can just read their tasting notes. And if the tasting notes say, this is a lovely citrusy coffee with lots of hints of fruits and berries, you know you're getting a, a light roast there. Whereas if it says, this is a real roasty, rich, dark chocolate sort of flavored coffee, um, you can bet it's going to be uh, a dark roast. And so traditionally, espresso was that bold and dark uh, type of bean. But people uh, have noticed that the, the lighter 
the lighter roasts, the medium roasts, are actually kind of brighter and juicier and, and sort of a more yummier type, type of coffee. So let's go back, and we'll talk about this in a sec, but let's go back to that, that chart of the, of the espresso I just pulled. And you can see that that flow rate wasn't actually flat all the way. It started off brewing at about 1.4 milliliters per second flowing into the cup and it ended around two. And the reason for that is that the puck breaks down. Remember we said well extracted coffee has 20% of that coffee ending up in the cup. What that means is over the 30 seconds or so that you're brewing, that puck is slowly disintegrating and breaking down. And so what happens is water breaks down, finds these sort of paths that, that it flows more easily, and then those paths of least resistance, more and more and more water goes through those points, and that's called channeling. So what happens is at those points in the puck, the coffee was getting over extracted. There was too much water flowing through there, and that's where the, the harshness and bitterness came from. And in the rest of the puck, it was under extracted because there was less water flowing to those parts. But when I pull a dark roast on the same parameters, you can see the flow rate's constant. And so dark roasted coffees, the puck holds together far better. So with a, with a dark roast coffee, it's actually really easy to pull a good, to pull a good espresso. Now I have to apologize, my, um, my numbers got corrupted, so I've, I've had to draw on the lines on the next ones, but you'll get the idea. So this is what a medium roast looked like before, uh, before I lost the data, is that slowly the puck broke down and that flow rate increased. And this is what a light roast looked like. Uh, it puck broke down a lot. And when I tasted that, it was not good. That light roast coffee where the puck broke down and water started gushing out, uh, it tasted really under extracted. Um, it was very sour and I didn't think it was very drinkable. The medium roast was okay, but it, but it could be better. So let's try a different strategy. This time, let's try and keep that flow rate the same all the way through and we'll slowly decrease the pressure and ha hopefully having lower pressure will stop those channels forming. And it works. So um, this, is, this is what I did um, for like a revised uh, version of the shot, was let's try and keep that flow rate just the same and just reduce the pressure. And you can see a dark roast was perfectly fine all the way, it handled the pressure, but a medium roast I had to go back, instead of the standard nine bars, that there was about four and a half bars of pressure um, to, um, to brew that coffee. And so what, the, what that medium roast tasted like was much, much better. Uh, because I was much gentler with it, it tasted much more sweeter and more balanced and all of that harshness had gone. So this machine was, was a machine where you're able to dial up and down the pressure at whatever you like. But you can, you can do this uh, with your home espresso machine. Um, all machines have got something called an overpressure valve. Um, this is usually, it should be set to nine bars, but sometimes from a factory it's even set at 10, 11, or 12 bars. Um, and for, for medium and light roast coffees, you'll find that that will be really sour. Uh, and so what you can do is you can um, change the setting or, or uh, change the springs inside your overpressure valve. And if you knock that down to something like six bars, you'll get much sweeter, more, more um, balanced tasting uh, lighter roast coffees. There's a second thing that you can do, um, which is called the Slayer mod, um, which I'm sure is, is a trademark term, so we can't, well, there's a, there's a company called Slayer who have uh, flow controlled machines. Um, and so this here is a, a popular espresso machine, uh, it's called the Breville Dual Boiler. And on the left, there's a, a knob for, uh, for controlling uh, water, for turning on and off water. But what you can do is you can open up inside, reroute um, those, um, you can see there's some, some lines drawn on there, but you can reroute the, um, the tubes. And what that means is you can use that same knob to flow, reduce the flow. So what you can do is hit an espresso, and then as it starts, as the, as the, um, the, the shot continues, just turn down and down the pressure. And this sort of mod you can do on lots of different machines. And this will enable you to have much sweeter, um, more balanced tasting coffees uh, without having to buy an expensive machine. A more expensive machine, I should say. Uh, and now, let's start talking about a few different things that are about breaking the rules and breaking free from, from that standard. Um, so remember we talked about uh, temperature. Um, what, uh, what actually makes the best tasting espresso 
is if you um, decrease the temperature over time. If you start with a really hot, um, as hot as possible in the brew chamber, but then by decreasing it, it stops that harshness coming at the end. So if you can find a way to get hot, hot water right at the beginning, and then slowly cool the water throughout the, the course of the, um, the brew. Um, I highly recommend preheating the components, but you can also um, install an aftermarket PID. So this here is um, helping your, your machine get much more temperature stability. Um, we're going to talk about three different ways of pulling, uh, pulling shots just before we finish up. So this was the everything by the numbers. Um, but to make this taste a bit better, uh, what we can do is try and make that pre-infusion phase um, as even as possible. So we want to get the puck saturated really, really quickly and then leave it a couple of seconds. And so th this here is 80% of the time when I uh, make a cup of coffee, um, this is the type of uh, profile that I'll use. I'll have the water flowing in really fast waiting up to 10 seconds so that that, that saturated puck can, um, can pre-infuse and then having a slowly uh, declining uh, pressure over time. And so that, that there is the way that you can um, get medium and lighter roasts uh, as, uh, as easily as possible. If you've got a really light roast coffee, um, this, um, what, what you can do is something called a blooming espresso. And if you've got a coffee machine where you can turn on and turn off the flow rate, uh, what you can do here is flow the water in and then stop, let it all saturate inside and wait up to 30 seconds and then pull the rest of the shot. And it sounds kind of crazy that there was over a minute to pull that shot of coffee, but it means that you can be really, really gentle and pull great tasting light roast coffees. The final way uh, that is, uh, people have, um, have tried is a turbo shot, which is where you pull a really, really fast shot by grinding coarser, and this is what, the, this is what it looks like there. Um, so this here is like a much um, lighter tasting espresso. Uh, it's a, something you can do with lighter roast beans. So that was the, um, they were the different things. Let's summarize it all into a few different tips. So um, if you're making a dark, if you're, if you're roasting a dark bean, um, your espresso machine will probably do a great job. Um, but if you want to taste those sort of more chocolatey, um, uh, sort of fruity flavors of, of lighter roasts, there's some things that you need, to, you need to do to be able to achieve that. So be really careful about grinding and tamping your, your puck because you don't want those water channels to form. Uh, if you can, pre-infuse it for longer, if you can stop the machine or find a way to restrict that flow. Um, if you've got a light roast, use the hotter water if possible. And then um, finally, about you, see if you can use um, lower pressure. So rather than having a full nine bars, which is really harsh on the puck, um, look at using, changing that setting on the overpressure valve to have a, um, a lighter, uh, a more gentle extraction. And so if I was writing the ISO standard, here's what I would change it to. Um, I would have two different standards, one for dark roast coffees and then a second standard for lighter roasts. I would assume that not everything was a straight line and so I would have a section in there to say you've got to take time to do some pre-infusion because you can't just immediately slam that puck with water. And I would, I would focus more on the flow rate of water into the cup instead of the, the pressure, because it does most of the time make sense to reduce that pressure over time if you can. So that there is uh, my final thing. Unfortunately, I have nothing to do with the ISO standard, and so I don't think it's gonna get changed anytime soon. And based on um, the, Italian, uh, the Italian espresso, I think that they are um, going to keep things very traditional there as well. Uh, so that's all from me. Uh, happy espresso.